Good evening, everyone. And, and welcome to Oheb Shalom, first of all, to start. Um, tonight is actually a very special evening, and we are delighted to host and co-sponsor the screaming of um, a wonderful film called Stranger Sister. I got that right? Um, and it is uh, co-sponsored by the Sisterhood of Shalom, Salam Shalom, as well as Corina and Oheb Shalom. Um, it's going to be a 40-minute film, I believe. It is really interesting. I got to see some of it in preview as we were preparing. And then there'll be Q&A with some panelists afterwards. So we, we thank you for coming out in this rainy-ish kind of weather. And we hope this is a tremendously inspirational and interesting evening. Can you say anything now? Do you need to say anything now? What? Roberto. Oh, OK. Roberto, and then you? Roberto, and then you? OK. Michael Roberta. Ready? I got it. Okay. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. When I'm not here, I'm there in South Orange, and my family has been associated with OHEB since 1993. I think my husband, Charles Wantman, is among you tonight. Charles, if you're there, please stand up and point yourself out. We're so pleased that you're showing Stranger Sister tonight. And I'm so pleased that you're going to have a panel discussion afterwards with my dear friends, Debbie Weinstein, Saba Khan, and Elise Carter. Elise is the co-leader of Essex 2, the chapter that I belong to in South Orange, and she recently traveled to Morocco with us, and we all had a great time. I would also like to give a special thanks to Alicia Kistner for having organized this evening. You're in for a real treat. This is a wonderful movie about the beginnings of the sisterhood, and it perfectly expresses what we stand for, which is building relationships between people, and what we stand against, which is hate. You will be inspired by the vision of founders Cheryl Olitsky and Atia Aftam, and as I recall, there's even a few of you in this movie. I've been, in the, I've been the national president of the Sisterhood for almost four years, and during that time, there's been tremendous change. First and foremost, a couple of months after I became president, Cheryl announced that she would like to retire after 10 years of brilliant leadership. We immediately instituted a search committee and we found our next leader very close to home. Actually, she was on the board as the, serving as the treasurer. Tahia Vicalo was perfectly poised to take this position. She had spent years in the nonprofit world working for the American Friends Service Committee in the Philadelphia area, responsible for all of programming in all of Asia, and particularly in Israel-Palestine. She also brought to us a wealth of information on HR, having managed Montessori schools in Philadelphia and Delaware for a number of years. In addition, she was at the time the president of her mosque, something that is not a normal thing or is unfortunately doesn't happen as much as it should. More importantly, her interfaith work is part of her DNA. She was born into a family of devout Muslims. Her grandfather was an imam who was persecuted by both the Nazis and the communists and who encouraged her to engage across the rainbow of religions that comprise her native Sarajevo. Yes, she is a native of Sarajevo, Bosnia, and yes, she is a survivor of the siege of that city. Came to this country as a student and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a couple of degrees in anthropology. Tia was the right person at the right time. The sisterhood is no longer in its infancy, and with maturation comes growth. 
In our early years, we had a strict rule that we never discussed Israel-Palestine in a chapter until that chapter had been together for at least two years and had established trust among itself, among the members. Um, within the last two years, the uh, board of the Sisterhood has determined that we actually are going to enter that conversation, and we're doing it carefully and thoughtfully. I hope that uh, some of you at least were in the webinar this past Sunday when um, we had Aziz Abusara and Elad Vizana, two longtime friends and peace workers from Israel, Palestine, who expressed their view on the establishment of the state of Israel from very, very different perspectives. They are our model for engaging in difficult conversations, and you will be hearing more from them. We are at the beginning of this, but it is our vision that in the future, the Sisterhood will be the go-to organization for others to learn how to build bridges between Muslims and Jews and to create shared societies in Israel and Palestine and elsewhere, like here in our own communities. Tahir is going to tell you much more about all of this. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome my professional partner and dear friend, Tahia Vikala. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me just un undo the, the cable. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. And, and um, I am so happy to be with all of, with all of you. Um, I just wanted to say I was actually coming in with Charles, Roberta's uh, husband, when he uh, mentioned that, that the name of the synagogue is the, the lover of peace. And I just love the name of the synagogue. And once again, there is a parallel with Arabic, where the word for love is hub. So it, it's, it's in the word itself. So I just love hearing that. So uh, Roberta was fantastic. I don't know what else to say. I think. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry she's not here, so I can return some of the kind words she had to say for me, she has been my mentor and, and support, and it's been just amazing working with her. Uh, she did, um, you will see in this movie some of the sort of evolution or beginnings of chapter creation and all the wonderful things that we have done over the years with the sisterhood. But I think what, what we are embarking on right now is, is a little bit of a sort of, we were in infancy and now we're kind of in teenage years in, in, in organizational development. And also we have to recognize that so much has changed on socio-political uh, level here and around the world and that we are really kind of dealing with, with more intense and different issues uh, at, at this time. So uh, I just want to briefly speak to where, where we are hoping to go. As Roberta mentioned, that um, we were focusing on relationships, right? That's how chapters were created. We were focusing on getting to know each other, sharing rituals, sharing food, sharing families, and um, all of it is absolutely wonderful. So we really grew close and became very close friends and sisters. And uh, Cheryl used to say, when, you, when, when, you, when someone is your sister, you cannot hate them. And I absolutely agree. But I like to add that when someone is your sibling or sister, you have higher expectations from them, right? It's a normal thing. To, so I think we, we really need to be ready to have higher expectations from each other because we are so close and we know each other. And we can do a lot together. So uh, the, the board decided in December to sort of refocus a little bit. We kind of went in all kinds of um, it, social justice issues because so many sisters were interested in different things around the country. And we still want to encourage this uh, to, to be happening. But I just want to, I'll briefly just explain that we are continuing to build our relationships, 
to strengthen our relationships and at the same time continue with that social justice aspect, but with the focus on anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish bigotry, which was a big part of our engagement from the very beginning. And we all know that that's not going anywhere, unfortunately, and, and are witnessing in, even intensified hate that is uh, around the country. And the other thing is that we finally are ready to talk about Israel-Palestine. So that's another social justice issue that we'll be working on very intentionally. We're doing a lot of training, facilitation and dialogue training, and opening, sort of creating this safe, but at the same time brave space where we can really be close and share and hear each other's narratives, hear each other's stories, and see where we, how we take that further than, than just you know, where, where we're at right now. So I don't wanna take too much uh, space. I, I uh, would like to thank you all, and I'm, I'm gonna be here after the movie. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer, but we are looking forward to what comes next for the sisterhood with uh, all these hopefully great changes that are coming in and keeping that beautiful friendship and sisterhood that was created from before. So thank you so much. So good evening. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. And Hello to all of you on the YouTube stream. Uh, tonight we're going to see the movie Stranger Sister, and it's the story of two ordinary women, and you'll see Cheryl Olitsky and Atiyah Aftab, who started the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom because they believed that they, our two communities could join hands to fight the, uh, the hate and white supremacy and uh, religious bigotry that had taken hold in our country. And uh, so it required a little bit overcoming, a little, little bit of mistrust, but that was done through their hard work and through getting other women involved and finding, we actually found there was a tremendous interest in being part of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. So the movie follows women from the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, chapters in Austin, Chicago, across the nation, that is my sukkah at the end. <laughs> and it will show you the powerful network of hope in a time of chaos that challenged our assumptions about who we are and how we can fight hate. And uh, there's still turmoil and violence and hatred going on. There were fire bombings just this week in two uh, mosques in Minneapolis. So, and we, are, we ourselves experienced a recent uh, attempted fire bombing in Bloomfield. So uh, this is still a fight that we need to fight, and I now welcome you to watch The Stranger Sister. I'm really trying very hard to get Muslim women involved. 
and right. I'm reaching out to the mosques okay. to see if we can get some more people okay. to join the groups. Matia, how are you? Co-founder, how are you? Oh, how are you? so nice, nice to meet you. I I love the the, the prayer and I've never heard a woman do it before. And that was I was moved to tears. That's a Jewish woman. <laughs> Most powerful call to prayer. I I don't know how to get so emotional. No, I think just us coming together to pray. I think that was really powerful. Yeah. The United States has a right to control who enters our country. For this reason, I issued an executive order to suspend immigration for visitors from six countries. of people out here peacefully protesting. Peace be with all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom alaikum to everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I stand in front of you as a Muslim woman, as an immigrant, and it is my great pleasure to stand with those who are being demonized today, to be standing up for the other, and therefore the other doesn't, isn't the other anymore. We're all in it together. Cheryl? I stand before you tonight because we want a better world. And we're praying with our feet by attending rallies. We have to continue doing that. But tonight is different. We are here to take care of our souls. These are really hard times. A travel ban against Muslims brings back memories that those of us who are Jewish are too familiar with, and it brings back our darkest fears. We're here to nourish ourselves. We're here to share prayer, to share prayer with the sisters of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, and this is going on across the country. We have at least 20 other vigils going on, over 1,000 women just tonight doing the exact same thing. So if we could all make a circle. What you often hear is, I never met a Jewish person before, or I never met a Muslim person before. You know, ignorance is a trigger of hate. It's real easy to hate someone you don't know. Religious inspired hate crimes are on the rise. Symbols of hate written in red on the House of Worship in North Miami. Deadly Beach. attack in Portland. Anti Muslim tyrant. Police are investigating a hate crime at the Chicago Loop Synagogue. Taking a sledgehammer to the window. Sure. Yes. So, many so we're expanding all over. So Chicago, all over the country. Yes. Okay. So, okay. so welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Where do you live in the city? Uh, I don't live in the city. Okay. I live in the western suburbs, St. Charles. So I drove like an hour and a half to come to this. When we started this, I couldn't possibly foresee what is surrounding us today. And as minority women in the United States, and especially today, we are targets of hate big time. And together, our voice is incredibly strong. So can you imagine if we speak with one voice, the power we have? So the, so the chapter forms, and there are uh, two co-leaders, one Jewish, one Muslim. <laughs> We've got our co-leaders for the chapter. Thank you very much. Rachel and I have known each other for three years now as an immigrant and someone who's non-citizen. Um, I didn't want to put myself out there uh, to be on a you know, watch list, <laughs> you know. Um, but then after missing the Women's March, I really thought it was important for me not to be afraid um, because that wouldn't put me in a better place. You know, I'm very, very bothered by just increasing 
you know, hate speech and, and anti-Semitism and um, Islamophobia. So I really want to do something that makes a difference. You know, show the world that the Muslims and the Jewish can promote peace in this world instead of all those hate. You know what it's like to feel like the other. So you kind of know what everybody else who's an other is also experiencing and feeling. So right now, when we're being inundated with all this horrible news, this bomb threat, that phone call, these children evacuated, you can't help but feel compassion because you felt it yourself. You know what they're feeling. There's action in these statements. It's not just talking and thinking and feeling, but there's action. Thank you all. You have just passed from an introductory meeting into the chapter discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a traditional really queen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. How old is your daughter? She'll be 14 next month. Oh, wow. And how did she pick up sewing? She's very artsy. And I wanted her to feel safe, and I said, are you afraid? And she said, no, I, I'm, I'm not they worried, not I'm not know, scared. Yeah, I do not know the meaning of it yet. She said, but mommy, what if, what if a bomb goes off during services? I just recently read about it. And I didn't know what to say to her. I you know, know, some of my Malaysian friends, they yeah. do not have any Jewish <laughs> friends that say yeah. bad, you know, have bad uh, perceptions of the Jewish, and then you become very prejudicial. Yeah, yeah people do, for sure. So why women? I will quote my husband. When I don't quote him, I get in trouble. Women are from Genesis. Men are from Leviticus. Women navigate the world through relationships. Men's through rules and responsibilities. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But if our mission is about building relationships, and we want to do that as quickly as possible, who are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on women. I used to say we're not a political organization. We don't discuss politics. There are women in the sisterhood who voted for Trump, and that's fine. And there are women who voted for Hillary, and that's fine. And there are women who didn't vote. What is not fine is for women to say, I don't want to take care of you, and I'm not going to fight hate, because that is what we do. If it wasn't for your persistence in trying to call me, and I think you did call me three times before I called you back. And then you called. Do you yes. remember? Yes, I did. And I can't explain the experience to anyone yeah. when they've asked me yeah. how it felt yeah. sitting there with you and yeah. saying, oh my gosh, I found the mirror image of myself. Yeah. Like if we had run into each other, we maybe wouldn't have connected. We're different religions. Um, you have grandkids. I had little kids at that time. Like we were at different, we were at different stages different in our life. Stages. We ended up at the end of that probably three-hour coffee, um, coming up with a plan: have six Muslim women and six Jewish women to come together. I wanted it to be a diverse group of women. I didn't want it to be one ethnicity, one level of practice. You know, we're not monolithic. It was very life-changing for me. It even was crazy. On that. I was doing it because I saw hate to Muslims, and I wanted to make sure that the Holocaust never happened to my Muslim brothers and sisters. Never could I foresee what we're facing today. Tip number one, prepare to be caught off guard. It's a whole new universe right now, as we know, as our kids know. So right now, write down just three questions that you know are likely to be asked in regard to the sisterhood. What are those three questions that you get them every time? Why are you interested in meeting Muslims? It's great. <laughs> How can you trust them? Right. Oh my God, verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> Except yeah, the How do you trust the, the Muslims? Um, How do you trust the, the Jews? Again, for you all, there are snakes in this grass who are looking to tear down this whole sector of engagement. I suppose it comes up all the time in right. the elevator and right. people in my own community who... What is behind the raised eyebrow? Exactly, right. exactly. And sometimes confront, you know, really right. people who are confronting you about what you're doing or not believing. And this work is really about power and how you have as much power as you can in a situation you can't script. So how do you stay in the driver's seat? More often than not, and it's almost in every interview, 
I get challenged, well, but what do you guys really do with Palestine and Israel? Trying to get us to go there, get me to go there. Um, Athea is a pro at responding to that. Muslims have to be. Um, and, and so if that's, I found that I don't think I've ever done an interview where they haven't tried to get me to go there. And um, Athea even like says it better than I do. The Muslim and Jewish relationship has been a relationship that's over 1,400 years old. And it is not a relationship that should be looked at only within the current political lens. Um, and so I, you know, and I say this is about interfaith, this is about love, this is about connections of peace. We don't, you know, we don't always yeah. talk about, yeah. it's not about politics, it's about our shared values, period. What else? After 30 years of marriage, I didn't expect to fall in love with Muslim women. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Love and understanding benefits everyone. And what we're trying to remind everybody is what really makes America great again. Ooh. Ooh. When we were invited to Megyn Kelly, I wasn't necessarily a fan of Fox News. So we talked about this. But I don't think that we want to seek out every kind of media. To your point, if the people you most desperately want to reach only watch that show and they didn't tell the story, right, right, right. that's a loss. Right. You know, the protest and the counter protest. I told Omar that you're doing this solidarity fast, and he was like, What? Why, why aren't we going? I'm like, Well, we already have. I know. I think, oh my God, he was so upset. <laughs> okay, so, Bill, you got my message about the dinner stuff? Uh, dinner, yeah. Then you are released. <laughs> Please just come back before we eat. Oh, hold on. This is Atia. Hey, listen, um, uh, Shadia, the co-leader here in Austin, she's here with me. We're getting stuff ready for the iftar tonight. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. We heard that there were quite a few other protests, these anti-Muslim, anti-Sharia protests, somewhere around the number, like, maybe 19 or 20. Yeah, I believe it was 19 in major cities, Chicago, Boston. You know, when Cheryl was talking about how we want to address these rallies, she was talking about the need to um, to do something different as opposed to just counter it, right? We don't want to we don't yeah. want to create more hate and more tension. But the counter protest is, is not a way to dialogue. It, it just like you said, it turns into something negative atmosphere, screaming back and forth. Perhaps it's not necessarily a place where people are sitting down and saying, "Oh, how different are we?" or "What are your thoughts?" What 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 do you think Sharia is? Who do you think Muslims are? You know my friend Evan? Mm -hmm. She just texted me. She's in San Marcos headed to Austin. And she saw this big bus full of riled up looking white guys. Right. And I quote, they look riled up. We'll get as much information as possible. Any description, what color red, number of people, a license plate if possible, what type of bus. She said, it was the size of a school bus, totally full, two adults per seat. Okay, we will get all this information to you right now, inshallah. Two adults per seat. The mosques are gonna be full tonight. Yep, yep, every one of them. We're trying to see if the police will just make sure that they go by the mosques and- So he's, gonna, he's going to contact the anti-terrorism task force. Okay, so cool. it's not even okay. cops, he's going of like the FBI, I suppose. So, okay. You know, a clear route, God forbid, if they had to right. run inside right. or something. Just keep the kids close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what is the deal? Which mosque? No, there's no one mosque. There, um, 
They're just going to be careful. They're just going to check and make sure everything's okay. Virginia's governor declared a state of emergency in Charlottesville. This comes after a day of clashes between alt-right protesters and counter-demonstrators earlier. The rally was shut down. One person is dead and 19 injured after... You had a group on one side that was bad, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Not all of those people were white supremacists. What country is this? I thought the stories of bigotry and hate were relegated to the fringes of society. I was wrong. This is the 2017 hate group analysis. The number of hate groups operating in the country in 2017 remained at near historic highs. I think you all be particularly interested in this. We added two male supremacy groups to the hate list. It's the first time we've done that. Okay, so what can we do as our, with our group, as individuals, as a collective? What piece of advice would you give us to help fight hate? It is a community effort. You guys obviously have brought communities together in a way that quite frankly, I, I, I've not seen before, not in such an organized way. This story of the civil rights movement is really a story of ordinary people who did extraordinary things. You know, we're not just talking about, you know, what happened with African Americans back in uh, the 1960s, but we're also talking about issues of the Holocaust. We're talking about issues of Islamophobia, past and present. And I think, you know, the more that we engage those sorts of stories and engage those sorts of experiences, again, I think the better off that we'll be. So it's not your history, my history, it's our history. We want the visitors to be as immersed as we can get them and we want you to walk away different than the way you came. So yeah. hopefully okay. you'll... That's exactly our mission. Yes, yeah, that's actually. what's happening. You're standing in historic footprints. This is Brown Chapel AME Church. This church became the center of the movement in 1965. I grew up in this church, so I know that. The march on Turnaround Tuesday, led by Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy, left from right here, right where you're standing. The successful march from Selma to Montgomery also left from right here. Our stories must be told over and over and over. Social movements are like jigsaw puzzles. Everybody has a piece. If your piece is missing, is the picture complete? Shalom, everyone. In Hebrew, we say shalom. 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 And in Islam, we say salam. Salam. So that's also what our name is, the sort of Salam Shalom, because uh, both of those words also mean peace, hello, and goodbye. So thank you all so much for having us. Um, how do you say thank you in Hebrew? Shalom. <laughs> how do you say it in Urdu? Um, shukriya. Shukriya? Shukriya. Okay. Does everyone want to say that? Shukriya. <laughs> Each group is going to receive a board and a set of cards. And the board has three categories, Judaism, both, and Islam. So we're going to have you discuss for a few minutes, and then we'll go back as a class and you'll uh, share with us, OK? But still, they still have a lot of similarities to us. Islam and Judaism. Moses is Jesus. 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 Um, both because uh, uh, Islam has the Quran, and I think Judaism has uh, has a different has like a, 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 a different different type of book. Yeah. yeah. Um, what sacred texts? 
It's the Torah and Judaism and the, uh, um, I don't know what's it called. Yeah, I know, but it's not really safe. Okay. Uh, it's it's Moses is us because we have the Old Testament. Yes. Abraham and Sarah. So you guys are correct. Abraham and Sarah is, all, is in Judaism, but it's also in Islam. The section's getting a little bit crowded. But. <laughs> Houses of worship and places to pray is both because Jews have um, a synagogue and Islams have the the mosque. So. And then we have shank bone. the shank bone, which I roasted okay. um, from lamb. So that has to do with sacrifice, like sacrificing a lamb. And this is what you made. So this is the ferocity. So this is made from apples. And uh, I put raisins and dates in here. Nice. So yeah. we could, this is kind of a, a new addition. We could put an olive on our plate. Um, and that symbolizes peace in, in the Middle East. So that we hope that the Israelis and Palestinians can make peace with each other. Amazing. That's great. Hello. You. Hello. Your husband was helping me. Oh, so excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. We're so excited to have you guys here. We're so excited yeah. to be here. Yeah. 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 It's been a long time to hold that door. That's okay. You can wrap it in. Thank you. You guys ready to, to break fast? Yeah. yeah. Right. Don't you first break it with a date? Yes. yes. It's called the Sunnah because of the Prophet. Uh, broke the pass with the day. Let's put the parsley and the salt water next to each other. And we'll kind of just start it over here. Rachel, mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong. So Miriam, mm -hmm. Moses' sister, was the one who followed Moses down the river in the basket? I think so. Right. I'm not positive about that. OK. Um, but Miriam did played this really important role in getting the, the, the Jewish slaves out of Egypt. Yeah. But she's not really talked about. Normally, we put out a cup for Elijah. He's the prophet. So God willing, we ask him to come to our Seder. Now, what women are doing is they're actually putting a cup down for Miriam as well. And, you know, one of the terms we bend down in front of uh, the Creator, right? Being very humble in front of God. Right. That's... that's, that's really what we're trying to do when we pray. Salam and shalom, everyone. Hello. 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 Welcome to Passover Seder. What about the Catholics? We want in. <laughs> so, this is the question we get asked a lot. We are unique in that we are trying to retain our religious identity amongst the majority. So, you know, whether it's issues of um, holidays that are different than what everyone else is celebrating or the majority is celebrating. So we feel like we have a, that common kind of challenge. What I think is so great about it, though, is that faith, unfortunately, religion, 
unfortunately, has been used in recent years to divide us mm -hmm. in so many ways, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys are turning it completely on its head. It's right. something that can actually unite us and feel, help us feel better about each other, mm -hmm. even if we don't agree perfectly. Let's be comfortable with each other. And you talk about challenges. I mean, definitely challenges from the Muslim side of, oh, you're, you're meeting with Jewish people. Does that mean you're normalizing Israel and Palestinian issues? I'm like, this is not about that. This is about faith. Let's build one relationship at a time. And you know what? Maybe that'll reverberate and peace will spread. I realized in 2014, during the Gaza assault, was that the work that I had been doing was incredibly superficial. That there wasn't anything underpinning those children of Abraham, let's eat hummus together conversations, that could make us last. We have not squarely talked about this issue in the 10 years of our charter chapter. Uh, we haven't. So, yeah, we and we have not. And, um, which is, I guess, curious. And I think uh, clearly, <laughs> well, but, and, and we as a board have not squarely talked about this issue. I think we've, we've been, been ready. ready. <laughs> Why are we stalling? What is the fear? We don't share religious beliefs. We don't have to share political beliefs. I just don't understand why that is a rift between people. And this is how I think things evolved in our chapter, the perspective of talking about our stories. Like I said, I don't have a story on this issue. I don't have a story. So I'm not sure. No, no, I understand. But, okay, then the conversation's done at that point. Right? Narrative right. is about so, what, 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 what leads you to feel a certain way about something. It could not be a personal story, but it could just be your feelings. I wonder how beneficial it is. Down the road, there's surface. And I can say, this is my story. You can say, this is your story. Is that going deeper? The reason why I think narrative is important mm -hmm is because if I read a story about um, some study that was done by some scholarly group that says Palestinian Muslims believe X, Y, Z, I can't just walk and say, oh, so um, if you happen to be Palestinian, if you, then it, you, that's how you believe. Stories are subjective, and they're coming from an emotional place. And it's a great way to dodge around facts and figures and statistics and realities on the ground. And I think that's where it gets complicated. I'm not trying to exclude anything. I'm trying to add your realities, because I think that for our relationships, your realities are really important to me. So for some reason, there is definitely an inherent mistrust with working with a lot of Jewish groups. There seems to be an undercurrent of feeling there's always an alternative agenda. This is a mythology, and it's a mythology that's continually being perpetuated. This idea that people have ulterior motives is just at the heart and soul of conspiratorial thinking. And what so we're, what we're, what we're trying to actually change the narrative Exactly. Exactly. That's, 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 yeah. exactly. that's exactly. exactly. That's the part that's so yeah. hard and so painful, exactly. because that's our mission. Yeah. That's, 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 that's our direct, direct mission. Right. 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 That yeah. is our direct right. But I agree right. with you, but why can't Cheryl be a Zionist and I be a BDS supporter? I have felt at times that my Muslim sisters may assume things about what yes. I think and feel that belie my, my true feelings about the issue and um, heartbreak in the issue. Yeah. And if we don't get there, I feel labeled or, um, and, and words like Zionism get yeah. used and they mean so many right. things to different I've people. I've challenged people. We said we can respect each other and love each other and feel like we can have our own opinions. I think that's very helpful because then I'm understanding what your beliefs are and what you think yeah. about it. The same way I didn't know that there's a lot of Jewish people that are very upset about what's going on in Israel. And I was like, really? I never knew that because I don't hear that narrative ever. The good news is that once you start having those conversations, it's not all gonna be, you know, happen at once, but you're gonna have little conflicts and then you're going to recover from that and your relationship will be stronger. Help, help me start at the grassroots level while we're dealing with the global. Yeah. But that's actually a great idea and I think we should talk to all of our co-leaders about that. That should be part of the topic for the month. For this kind of conversation, we want to lead with what we're not certain about. We want to lead with how this issue touches us as Jewish Muslim women. We want to lead with our armor released. 
and our listening, and this is familiar with what we do all the time, our listening is not to react, but we're listening to go deeper into relationship with uh, another person. Okay, the question is, how have events related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict affected you personally? I'm, I'm nervous about kind of getting to a point and then falling back again and getting back to where we started out with. I think a lot of people are, well, this is what I've believed and this is um, what my family has believed and so I'm either dishonoring them to have a different opinion or um, I, I don't want to say that I'm wrong. There is a growing uh, anti-Palestinian movement in Israel, that it's getting stronger, that it's getting more separate, and that there's a whole movement toward the one-state solution, you know, one state. But my understanding is that the you know, Palestinians were there first. Mm -hmm. um, the question I ask myself is, like, how do I reconcile the fact that Israel, either actively or passively, has been presented to me as a, as a Jewish person, as a, as a safe place, um, as a, like the only place in the world where like that's Jewish. Um, how do I reconcile that with, you know, war and taking people out of their homes? After communal prayer, congregational prayer, my, you know, my father would make these prayers like, pray for the people of Palestine, the people of Kashmir. There'd be this whole like couple of lists. So it's just always, ingrained and embedded that the injustices of the Palestinians and the Kashmiris and others were something that we as Muslims were praying for. It affects me in the sense that this is my larger community, right? So your, you know, your idea of like you're saying Israel is a safe space, I don't even know if, if you went there you would feel that it was a sp safe space, but there's no country that I could go to that's my safe space. I'm an American. This is my safe space. We have to acknowledge the fact that trauma healing is the basis of peace building and that that needs to happen first and foremost because until then, like you said, you don't see the humanity in the other side. Instead, we've got to acknowledge that another per person, families, communities have been hurt. You put your finger on it and it's a comfort. It, 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 it's a comfort to the soreness in my heart to hear what you came up with, really. Thank you for making yourself so vulnerable to us. Yes. I know that that must be difficult. Thank you for listening. Of course. I think, though, that the four of us are basically on the same page <laughs> with a lot of things, which wouldn't necessarily happen in your chapter meeting and certainly wouldn't happen at my synagogue. Everyone, everyone take a breath. It was very liberating. Um, liberating. Liberating because there were things that I have never said to anyone except for my own family. And I, I felt like, like a burden lifted because it was just like, you know, there were things that I said without fear of being judged. Our chapter in Milwaukee, we started last year around March, February or March. And I think we are ready to, to talk about this. Just about every officer has been dispatched to the Tree of Life synagogue. He had multiple weapons and an AR-15 assault rifle. The initial reporting is that there are multiple fatalities. We are going to be running a little longer this morning because we all need to express our grief and we're going to do something that our souls crave. In Judaism, there is a tradition at the funeral of one's loved one of ripping your garments to represent the tear in your heart because of the loss. We will have 13 seconds of silence in memory of the 13 people who were massacred last weekend. Two who were killed because the killer couldn't get into their church and they were killed because of the color of their skin in Kentucky. And 11 who were killed in their sacred space where they were praying in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you.
breaking news overnight in New Zealand. 49 people were killed and more than 48 others injured in a mass shooting at two mosques. So where do you go from here? You take back your cities, you take back your states, you take back your countries, you raise your voice, you pray with your feet. There's a white male in the front of the synagogue. One person is dead, three others were wounded. In Poway, California. It wasn't just a shooting, it was a massacre. And thanks so much. God will it. Thank you. We have so many opportunities in our life to do something and we often kind of just wave and they pass by. The fact that you're here today shows that you're here to do something. You know, the spiritual aspect of Sukkot is <laughs> about like, the fragility of life and how, um, you know, everything's fleeting. I've been thinking about that a lot because it was such an intense experience, thinking of death and just like, what does that bring? And not knowing, it's really having no control. With the limited time that we have, um, of your family's personal um, immigration story, basically, like, how did you come to be an American? What is it? What is it to be American, and what do we believe in? She just said the bride, I want to go back home. Yeah, that's we true. try to educate our immigrant population that you are home. But they don't feel like this is home. Yeah. This attack shocked our community members, but we thank God Almighty for your support. While I'm thankful no one was injured in the blast, we all know this kind of hateful crime has no place in Minnesota. No one should be afraid to worship in the United States of America. Pray as if everything depended on God. Act as if everything depended on you. And so we gather here today to show our support for one another in friendship and in deep respect. Most of all, we gather here together to continue our learning process. And Alicia, I'll get your microphone set back right after that. You know, I have to repeat what my opponent wanted to say. She was said to be from Des Moines, Iowa. Right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to
it's a time for a Muslim prayer, so there's a brief break uh, while our sisters are out in the, um, the lobby doing their prayers. How and why did you get involved with the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom? Um, <laughs> now I have to remember. Uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was. Do you remember what year it was? But the chapter was in existence before I joined. Yeah, so I think I joined uh, due to the events of 2016. And um, the, you know, when they started to talk about the Muslim ban, it just really, really upset me tremendously. And um, so, you know, I think that, as, as I told a, a coworker, a Muslim coworker, when I was telling her about it, and um, I said my feeling at the time was, oh no, not on my watch. We've seen this movie before, not this movie. We've seen the movie, the persecution before, and I will do what I can do to, so this does not happen on my watch. And uh, I joined the Essex County chapter, and I think, uh, was Essex two in existence then? I guess not, one comes before two. Yeah, so, <laughs> When did chapter, the second chapter start? So we have had some change of membership in our, in our chapter. Some people moved away and we got new people. And so, uh, but it's, you know, pretty much the same group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Our Muslim sisters took a few minutes to pray their evening prayer. We're not going to do a full Mariv because that would take a little bit too long. That's what we call our evening prayer. It comes from the, from the word for evening. But at this time of the year, between the second night of Passover, going up to the, the start of our next festival, which is called Shavuot or Weeks, you'll get this in a minute, there's a connection, um, we count each night the day of the week and the, the day of counting, its significance is that in temple times, our ancestors brought a measure of barley to the temple as a sacrifice each, each evening. So there's an introduction. Hineni mechuna l'kayem mitzvat asei shel svirat ha'omer, k'mo shekatuv bat Torah, usvartem l'chem mimocharat ha'shabat, miyom haviachem et omer ha'tnufa, sheva shabatot t'mimot t'yena. I'm ready to fulfill the mitzvah, the commandment of counting the Omer. As it is commanded in the Torah, you shall count from the eve of the second day of Pesach when an Omer of grain is to be brought as an offering seven complete weeks. The day after the seventh week of your counting will make 50 days. And that's the beginning of our next holiday. And this is the blessing that we say, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Al Svirat HaOmer. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, who rules the universe, instilling us the holiness of mitzvot by commanding us to count the Omer. And just to make sure I get the right number. Uh, my phone. Uh, here we go. Hayom Esrim Yom Shehem Arba'a Shavuot La Omer. Today is 28 days, which is four weeks of the Omer, which means it's three weeks and one day till our next festival. Those of you counting, that's Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks, and we count the seven weeks till, it, uh, uh, till, till we get there. Now, if our panelists will come sit, um, there are four chairs. I was told there are four panelists. Take a seat, and I'll help adjust your microphones so, so that everybody can hear you. So I'll just start. Uh... In this 
Perfect. Yes, it is. I guess we're So, um, going to introduce our panelists. You've already met Tahia. Uh, Elise Carter uh, lives in West Orange, uh, and she's been interested in interfaith dialogue for many years. A friend of hers spoke at an early S Sister of Salam Shalom conference and told her about the organization, and she and her daughter helped start the Westfield chapter, and Elise recently went on the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom trip to Morocco, and she is a co-leader of the Essex II chapter. Saba Khan lives in Livingston as a member of the Essex I chapter. She's very active in interfaith work in both the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and the Livingston Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, for which she is co-chair. Asaba recently was instrumental in organizing the first interfaith iftar, which is the breaking of the fast during Ramadan, at the Islamic Community Cultural Center in Parsippany. And uh, Debbie and Elise and I were all there, and it was wonderful. Uh, Debbie Weinstein lives in Livingston, and she is a longtime member of Khabarat Lamdenu, which is an independent group uh, in Summit, and she joined the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom in around, around 2015, uh, she, she says by default. Uh, she had been in a Jewish Muslim women's group called Beads for Peace, which I think some of you might be familiar with. And they beaded together and chatted, and the group disbanded, and she missed the camaraderie and the friendship and the learning. And, uh, so she found Cheryl Olitsky on Google, <laughs> and uh, she, Cheryl is our co-founder, as you saw in the movie, and, and went to the second conference at Princeton and was lucky to find a local chapter. And so uh, our bonds are strong. You can't hate a friend. Uh, when Debbie's husband, David, a love of shalom, passed away, uh, it was one of our Muslim sisters who texted her nightly to make sure that she was okay. And you know her own family didn't do that. So um, uh, Debbie has also traveled with the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom to Berlin, Poland, and the Arizona border near Tucson. So uh, we are going to open up uh, <clears throat> to questions. Uh, if you are on the YouTube live stream and you have a question, uh, please text it to five one six six four two one four four. Zero. Okay, do we have any questions? Debbie. Um, I did not realize that you were praying separate all the time. Go up to the microphone so the people who are on YouTube can hear it. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Um, I did not realize is your praying, Muslim praying separate, male and female, all the time? Um, it depends where you are. And if you're in the mosque, then men and women pray together, men in the front and women in the back. This is such an exciting crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of questions, but I'll just it to one for right now. So you've met me, I'm a rabbi. Um, there have been women rabbis being ordained in the United States since 1972. I don't know the number of how many there are, but there are a lot of women who are in the rabbinate now. Um, I was fascinated to see that at one of the uh, prayer services in the movie, the, it was an all women's prayer service, granted, but that a woman was leading the prayers and doing the, the part of, I, if I get this wrong, I apologize, the muizen? How close did she I get was, to she it? Was try, she was being an imam, so adhan, which is a uh, call for prayers, yes. Right. Um, is that um, something that is new? Has a woman always, always been able to do that? I was always under the impression, apparently wrongly so, that only men could lead the prayers and only men could um, be the religious leaders of, of a, a, a Muslim group, prayer group. So I'd like to know what the women's role, if the women have a role that they can have in that. Thea, do you want to take it? I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you said, fairly recently, women, Jewish women became rabbis, right? So there, that's a fairly, re uh, within the century, right? And, and we have... One much later, but only one in Europe. 
But but what I want to say is it's a recent uh, uh, phenomenon, right? Uh, uh, there are many different interpretations, same as it, as in Judaism, of where women are allowed or should be leading the prayer. Same in Islam. Um, there are um, different groups that are um, now pushing for actually women having more presence in leading the prayers and leading communities. And there are mosques now where people are standing side by side rather than one in front and one, one in, and uh, women behind. And I just want to say that that's actually because we, as you know, we prostrate when we pray. So it is really very physical action that we have to perform. So it, it kind of physically makes sense to, to um, have that kind of thing. Um, presence of women was always there. And I usually like to say that uh, if we look at the community of the prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, women had such incredible presence in the community, in the leadership. There was a lot going on in the mosque space. However, as we know, over time, things get to be interpreted differently. So uh, as of now, I don't know that it is formally accepted for a woman to lead the prayer for men and women. But there, is a, um, there are some places where it's done, and there is a more push for having a, a, a more leadership presence during the prayer for women as well. However, it, it has not been, as long as there's enough of leadership in the community given to women as well, it's, um, that's, that's where the main, main focus is. May I, may I add of something course. to it? So, in my understanding, if there's a woman who has more knowledge um, of for leading a prayer than a man, she can lead the prayer from wherever she is sitting. Um, as uh, Tahir mentioned, that there is a certain way women pray in the mosque as well. We go down, we bow down. I will not feel comfortable if there are men behind me watching me go down like that. It's probably better that I watch them. So, um, so to answer your question, women can have knowledge and uh, education to be able to lead the prayers. It's formally not usually accepted, and the reason why you saw that in the conference, and I was present at the conference, because it was all women. Anyone? Rebecca? Come on up. I have two questions. First, I, I'm probably right that in Israel itself, or in the West Bank, in neither place, is there a group similar to your group? Where, or, it, or let me put it a different way, is there in any university in either place a group where there are both Okay, and that's the first question. There are, there are a lot of groups that work together. The, the uh, parents, the parents project where there are children, uh, parents whose children have been killed by each other have gotten together. There's um, the combatants for peace, there, there's a jazz band, there's soccer, there's, there's women, breast cancer. There's Women Wage Peace, mm -hmm. which is doing excellent work, which is very Israel. similar. In Israel. in Israel. Yeah, these yeah. were all groups in Israel. I think they get very little press, and that's the sad part. But I think there are a lot of people that are trying to work together. So, and, um, oh, sorry. So, co uh, Combatants for Peace, for example, um, is a, a group of people coming together, the Palestinians who have been in Israeli prisons, working together with um, former and current Israeli soldiers hmm. coming together to uh, push for peace and really trying to collaborate with um, just to, to teach people and to kind of move the country forward and teach people um, how much they all have in common and how they really need to work together because they live together. Is 
My second question is, if you're moving in the direction of a dialogue now, do you have ideas of what kind of projects or questions you'll be addressing? So what we are doing at the moment is we are doing a lot of training. Uh, we are finishing training for first cohort of our facilitators. Um, and uh, we'll start with another cohort uh, shortly. So by the end of this year, we hope to have a large group of sisterhood members who are trained well in facilitation and dialogue. And um, they would be our, as I call them, on-call people for different chapters or what or number of chapters to come and, and uh, discuss this. And we, at the same time, encouraging uh, this conversation to come, uh, to be initiated. Now, when you say what kind of issues, I think our main goal is to start, say, you heard a little bit of that in the movie, of saying, let's start with telling our stories, right? Let's start with saying what we feel when we talk about Israel, what we feel when we talk about Palestine and take it slowly in that conversation and go deeper in a very structured way with a lot of deep listening. We, the focus is not, we, we tend to be very reactive when we are passionate about issue, right? So we want to kind of jump in and t share our opinion. This is going to be more about deep listening and processing all the emotions and stories that people want to, to share with each other. We, we did sort of by accident wind up having that discussion. In fact, it was at a meeting at Saba's house. It sort of came up unexpectedly. And it, 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 I think we all learned so much from each other. And people were, I know the um, Muslim women were very surprised that most of us did not, were not followers of Netanyahu. And, and it was a very satisfying discussion. Yes, I, we, we tend, to, it's like, like you heard in the movie, that uh, we don't know, it's, it's almost always some fear in talking about these issues because emotions take over. And there's always, there's never a middle ground in these conversations. It's either I'm right and the other party will say I'm right. Um, and we all hear stories from what we want to hear. I, am, I was born and raised in Pakistan. Um, I'm not a Palestinian, I'm not an Israeli. I've been in this country for 25 years. I'm an American Muslim. Um, and my kids are born and raised in this country. They are American. They don't have another home, they have this home. Um, for me, it becomes a, a special issue, and I'll give you an example. Um, I have many Palestinian friends, so I hear stories from them. I don't have a direct connection or a story from that piece of land. But to all Muslims is a very sacred place. So when we hear stories like, the moment Ramadan starts, there is an attack in the mosque, it hits us directly. And then emotions take over. You don't want to hear anything else. If there are um, worshipers who are in the mosque and they're being killed. Mm. There is no other story outside that. So when it, it becomes difficult, and when we had the conversation, I've been with the chapter for five years now, and when I started, I, when I moved to New Jersey, um, I found Cheryl by accident. I looked for it, I found Cheryl, she called me and she said, there's a, there is a uh, sisterhood chapter right in your town in Livingston, and there's a meeting tomorrow. So I entered Debbie's house without knowing any one of them. Uh, like it was a cold November night, and I just knocked at the door. And since that time, we have gelled as sisters. I can talk to them about pretty much anything without being judged. So it was accidental conversation. It was a great conversation because every single one of us came from a point of compassion and understanding and deep learning from each other and not bringing emotions in the midst of it. So I have a friend here who's Palestinian and part Syrian and part Turkish. <laughs> She's part many things. Um, so when we have friends we hear stories from them, and that affects us deeply. Can I just add one more thing related to this? I think what's important is to look at the sisterhood interactions holistically, because this is, not, this is one part of our conversations. And I think we, the more we learn about other, each other's values, 
the more we realize how applicable they are to what we want to achieve in this world, right? So healing of the world is so present in both of our faiths, right? And they, are, they need to be very universal. So we need to, just sharing these values that are very universal values are applicable to not just this particular, particular topic, but many other challenging topics that we get into in our conversations. Have you found much support or opposition to the Salam Shalom group and program in your communities? Who are you asking? Everyone, whoever wants to answer. <laughs> Do you want to say it? Sure. Um, I hear nothing but interest from when I talk to people about our chapter and about the organization. People are curious, they're, they want to learn more, and I just find that to be really exciting because I think there's a real hunger and thirst right now for reconciliation and for dialogue. I usually get people who say, I didn't know you could be Jewish and Muslim at the same time. <laughs> so I sort of, <laughs> that's how that conversation gets started. I get mixed reviews from people. Some people want to know why I'm part of this group. Some people are curious, genuinely, what we can learn. And some people just outright tell me that uh, you're ostracized from the community being with the Jews. So um, I think I get mixed uh, comments from people. But I, I'll give you an exa a very good example, which, which you know, brings ba back faith in you. Um, the, when the Bloomfield... Um, Thing happened, the bomb, Molotov near, bomb. Near Tamid. Yes. Yeah. We had a big rally in Livingston. I'm the chair of committee for diversity in, uh, for diversity in Livingston, in the town of Livingston. We had a big rally, um, and I was one of the speakers. I was one of the only Muslims uh, who was there. And, and Yashim, who is, uh, I'm also the co-chair of interfaith committee at the Parsifni Mosque. So she was there. And the moment I started to speak, and the moment I said I'm a Muslim um, member of Muslim community in Livingston, I got heckled from, by people who were sitting up front, a couple of them. Um, I don't know who else was there. Were you there? No. No, you were not there. However, I have to tell you that the moment he started heckling, um, the county commissioner, Pat Siebold, who was sitting right there, shushed him, told him to shut up. And after I finished my speech, because I didn't stop, the rabbi, as well as a lot of uh, community members who are, who are Jewish and they're good friends of mine, they came to give me hugs right in front of the stage. And that man was gone, uh, wherever he came from, I have no idea. That tells me that while it takes a lot of courage to just stand in front of a, you know, three, 400 uh, Jewish community members and being the only Muslim to do a, do a conversation like, or have a speech like this, there are people who are also supportive uh, right there, and they were very appreciative of what I had to say about Islamophobia as well as, of course, uh, anti-Semitism. I don't, um, just if I can jump in and answer. You know, I, I usually think about this as um, someone who went through a, a pretty horrible war that was explained and, and promoted by religious differences, right? And uh, isolating everything that uh, religious identity is without bringing anything together. So I, I look at everything through that lens, and I think as long as we're hiding in our own communities in isolation and being afraid of reaching out or being with other people, we not only lose opportunity to learn about others, but we are losing opportunity to learn about ourselves. Right, so I usually say there's no day in the, in the sisterhood for me that I don't learn something about my own faith and questioning my own dedication to social justice while working on this. So it is, it takes courage, <laughs> I think for all of us, but it's, it's incredibly rewarding at the same time and incredibly needed, so. I think you have to embrace, we have to embrace our differences and, and love our similarities. That's what I go with always. It, it's okay to be different. 
It's okay to have different religions. You have to embrace that, who you are. It empowers you as a person, but also love your differences because you always learn something different from people. And at the end of the day, uh, from underneath the skin, we all um, have red blood. So, um, At a couple of the conferences, we've had the privilege of the sisterhood conferences. We've had scholars, we've had Jewish scholars, we've had Muslim scholars. And my takeaway so often was how similar we are in our histories, in our dedication, and, uh, and the stories we tell, the stories of our, um, of our faith and where things began. And I'm always taken aback by the similarities, the overlaps. The pronunciation of the words or the names might be a little bit different, but uh, the stories are the same. Next. I just uh, want to repeat the number to text if you have a question from uh, the live stream. 516-642-1440. And Marion? Yeah, I mean, there's a, an old saying, which I'll probably mangle, but um, that, uh, you know, in the Jewish community, that if you've got... Th uh, two Jews on a, de on a desert island, and you know they'll build three synagogues, and there'll be the synagogue for him, the synagogue for her. Well, usually, usually it's him and him when they tell, when they, and the one I no, I know that, and and the one I wouldn't be caught dead in. Um, and there are a lot of disagreements, and I'm not simply talking about you know people who, on the Israel-Palestine issue, people support APAC and those of us who don't. Um, you know, on everything. There's just a lot of dis disagreements. But I find when I'm sometimes discussing, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to discuss internal disagreements um, with people who are not part of your community. Uh, you know, there's a tendency to sort of, um, you know, kind of pull inward. Um, I just wondered how do you individually address that when you're getting into your, your dialogues in terms of how you... Um, discuss the, the disagreements that surely exist in the same way exactly in, in the Muslim community and, um, or in, and you guys in the Jewish community when you're discussing with, with, your, with your sisters um, uh, trying to talk about ideas that if you were in a, in a Jewish community, in a Jewish setting you know, you would you'd be rabid you know, you, these are things you don't agree with and yet, you need to respect, we need to respect all of us. Anyway, thank you. Sorry. That's a great question. And I, I just want to say we started something, and because of what you're describing, um, something called identity exploration. So we have a series of programs within the sisterhood where we're inviting sisters from different backgrounds. So we would have an Orthodox sister coming with Reconstructionist sister, Ashkenazi sister, Sephardim, um, Shia Muslim, Sunni Muslim. So to recognize the diversity in our own communities, because it helps us. We are always kind of like there are these two different religions with all these differences and, and we're different. But when we realize that there is such a spectrum of of beliefs and understandings and interpretations and cultural interpretations of, of our beliefs that when we understand that it exists in our community too, it's easier to relate to other differences. So I encourage you all to check out one of these programs we bring sisters to share uh, their own stories. So they're not speaking for all Jews or all Muslims. They're saying this is my experience as a Jewish woman or as a Muslim woman. So, um, but I think that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, good, and I think creating this sort of safe space, it doesn't go only to, for Muslim and Jewish women being together, but truly for all Jewish and all Muslim women being together so that we, that we can share the differences that exist in, in all of our communities. You're also just getting a select group of, of women that are willing to do this. So we have had members in our chapter who 
from when I came in who had dropped out. They, this, this was not for them. So, I mean, you're getting people who persevere and, and have an open mind and want to have a dialogue. And, and there is that establishment where you, you, you become friends and then you can, it's much easier, as Cheryl says, it's hard to hate your friend. So. One of the, um, uh, Saab and I had a brief conversation, I guess about six months ago, because um, there was, a, I, I don't remember how it came about, but there was a, a lot of online support and social media about support Israel, support Israel. And um, it was very disturbing to the Muslim sisters to hear just support Israel like, like it was a blanket statement. And we had a, a brief conversation where um, I was saying, you know, I, I support Israel's right to exist but I don't support the government and I don't support the, the government's policies. And I think it was sort of that little bit of, if, if that was okay to share no, that. Totally, but, totally. But, <laughs> but I it think was, we have a lot of conversation. I don't even remember this one. But. Because <laughs> we have so many conversations, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. No, but, I didn't. No, but just the, the idea, I mean, it's to be open to learning from each other. Um, and... I, again, as Alicia said, I, I went on the Morocco trip uh, with Tahia and 46 other women, and I just felt like I learned so much um, from both the Jewish sisters and the Muslim sisters. And it was really awe-inspiring to, um, to just spend that time just taking in... Um, the different, the, again, the spectrum of uh, women, you know, women who were extremely devout and, you know, devoted but more casual, women who covered, you know, who wore hijab, women who didn't, and, um, and the same in the Jewish community, you know, from um, people who were you know, very uh, active in their synagogues and their communities to people who identify as Jewish but aren't, don't, you know, don't, uh, maybe don't practice in the same kind of way. So I think um, all of us taking in that broad spectrum of individuals is, um, has really been, been very enriching. for being here. This is truly enlightening, and I appreciate your sisterhood. Um, I live in a very diverse, professionally and, and socially, in a very diverse world, and friends for 30, 40 years, and we have a really hard time with a dialogue, and there's only four of us. And we've tried a dialogue, and we walk away, we come back to it, and it's just been abysmal, especially over the past uh, 10 years, eight years. And what I... My question to you, I have two questions, and following up on um, Mary Ann's question, how do you, what is the way to enter into the conversation? Because I think education overcomes ignorance, overcomes, it, it, it's a, it's a um, domino effect. Mm. How do you start the conversation? What are the words that you say to your sister to start a conversation where it's not, not confrontational, not um, antagonistic? And my second question, which you may not get to, is now that you've started or entering into a dialogue on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, do you think you're ever going to become like a real political uh, force where you're actually going to take positions on things politically like BDS and other sort of issues? So you don't have to get to the second question. But <laughs> I'm really curious about the first one is how you start the conversation because I... I'm, I live by words, and I don't, can't put the words together to start a conversation without it becoming, as you said, um, personal, and I'm right, and you're wrong. Thank you. I think it starts with food. 
honestly, quite honestly, are amongst my little my little cover my little my group. It's always over food. It's always over dinner. It's always over brunch. But it it's it's not good. It's been really bad over the past number of years, and it's very um, troublesome to me because these are people that I, women that. We're actually, we call each other sisters. Yeah. And it is very troublesome to me. And if you guys can do it, could you share the way to open up the dialogue? I would really like to know what the magic words are. So, so the, your question is, is fantastic. And I think it really speaks to all these years that we were preparing for this, right? To start talking about this is not an easy task, right? Especially when we feel so passionately about something and there's so much love and emotion and uh, in anger and all kinds of things that come to the surface. That's why we, we're not approaching this lightly. And we are working with organizations who, who dedicated years of trying to get um, to, to people to talk and, and address difficult issues. I don't know if you're familiar if there's an organization called Resetting the Table that works, worked with, for, for a long time with just Jewish community. But now they're kind of expanding into other other communities as well. So we are, uh, and we're working with another organization, New Ground, um, that is working on the same issue. And this is their main focus. So we are trying to, by training our facilitators, right? We're trying to set that environment and the right conversation. So it's not ad hoc conversation. It's not something where we and learning how to say, okay, we need a. We need to take a break. We need these are the ground rules. Let's remind ourselves of ground rules. So I know it, it sounds a little unnatural to be com communicating that way, but it's really needed in, in these circumstances where we want to express our emotions and we want to express our opinions and hear each other. And we're combining this with educational events, right? So we ha we're bringing people from uh, from the region to talk about their experiences. So we hear from people who actually live this life every day, right? So that's very important. And it's also important for us to understand that we are all influenced by news sources where we are all exposed to, right? And how do we expand that uh, access to different resources and different sources so we can have a, more information coming? So it's a kind of a combination of things that we're working on, yes. To are resources available for people who are not in the chapter? We, so, so we have, um, we are working hard on really, because we only had chapters before, right? Now we have many more members who joined from around the country. So we will be having uh, opportunities for, for virtual conversations, for regional gatherings. For, so we will, we, we're building that capacity to really provide it with whoever would like to participate in this. Uh, you have a very important message to bring to the world, not only to bring to your chapters, but to bring to the communities. And I'm wondering if you have any initiatives for reaching into schools, for reaching into uh, community organizations, maybe you know, coming as a twosome or however you would do it, just to stress and to spread all the good things that you're doing into the more general community. Um, we, we, did, we did have the incident in South Orange, which I won't go into, but I know everyone's aware of it. And, and um, Cheryl did approach the school system and, and, and has a program. To, Great. But it was turned down by the school system. Hmm. But I think engaging the teenage uh, high school students, um, I think... Your, your question probably is also how to bring the kids together and have them learn mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from each other because that is the generation we really need them to have that kind of understanding and love uh, for, for each other's faith and each other. So the teenage groups have been instrumental in that. Okay. Uh, we are also, at least at our level, I know it seems like a drop in the bucket and I really hope that and pray that a larger community can learn to do what we are doing in small chapters. But at my mosque where I am the, uh, the, the interfaith co-chair, 
we brought in a lot of um, Cub Scout girls and school, high school girls Great. to come together and meet uh, other students in the mosque on a Sunday. And they had a wonderful time. Terrific. And that was really educational for every one of, every, each and every one of them. And at the end of the day, they just sat down in circles, started playing together. Uh, as if they knew all the games, so far we didn't know, but they knew. And I'm sure you fed them too. Uh, <laughs> lots of great food. So yeah, it's always around food. But thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yes, we always have food at every meeting. That's a big... Terrific. Uh, okay, uh, I'm the person to wind up here. <laughs> so uh, it, where, uh, where's the camera for the... Over there. Over there. Uh, so I should come over here. Uh, oh, has it, a question. It, but where is it aiming to? Right here. It's yeah. aiming at me. Yeah. That's a little. That's a little. That's a little scary. Uh, okay. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, your message is so important. And in a world where there is too much hate, you you do a, a wonderful job in on your own level in trying to push back to show that people care about each other, to show that people love each other. And, uh, you know, we wish you, all of us wish you a, a great deal of uh, uh, support and of love and, and of anything you need to go ahead and do what you do. Uh, I'm also going to uh, say, uh, from my point of view, as the educational chair of Colrena, it's been a real pleasure working with the folks at Ob Shalom, and I uh, hope that we can get some more programs going together sometime soon. And uh, forgive me for looking at notes. I don't want to leave anybody out. I um, want to just say uh, thanks to Michelle Strasberg, Ob Shalom's executive director, and her team for helping to put together this program. Uh, special thanks to Jackie Mayer, who designed the flyer and did the publicity for the program. She's in the office. And uh, the committee that worked on this for uh, a number of meetings over the last few months. Uh, I was on this committee, and of course, Alicia, Leo Gordon, Doug Magid, Alan Mendels, and Mike Schatzberg, who came here extra, an extra hour early uh, in order to set all this up so this would all work. Uh, thanks to the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, especially Tahia Vicalo and Roberta Elliott, uh, and uh, to the panelists, uh, which, uh, who, uh, who were um, Elise Carter, Saba Khan, uh, and uh, to also Tahia Bacallo and Debbie Weinstein, and uh, to Alicia, who moderated tonight. And um, also, uh, and a special thanks to Alicia, who had a vision and a passion and made tonight work uh, after a number of months of putting this together. So thank you, everybody. Now, yes. Pardon? Stand in front of the microphone. All right. Um, I just wanted to add something. Uh, first of all, uh, peace be upon you all. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious. Um, I would like to thank you for you know inviting me for such a wonderful event. I would wish to have you know to see more audience next time. Maybe contact me to bring more <laughs> advertising, because like uh, I I was lucky to uh, you know to be able to come today, and I wanted to uh, share uh, two things with you all, um, which is like a a verse from the Quran which exactly, you know, describes what we're doing right now. Um, oh, in the name of God, uh, oh mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other, not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is, is who is the most righteous, righteous of you and God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. And in all my life, studying the religion of Islam and being a Muslim, 
we learn that religion is how you treat others. So you're free to do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone and you don't hurt yourself. I mean, if you hurt yourself, that's fine, but you're not allowed <laughs> <laughs> to, hurt, to hurt the others. So religion is all about how you treat the others in the sight of God. And God here, you know, like in the Quran, in this verse, uh, he did not say, oh Muslims, oh Jewish, oh Christians. You know, it's like all mankind. It's addressed to all mankind. Uh, and with this, I just want to uh, thank you all. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, like uh, being here today. Um, and again, um, uh, we have also one more thing, like answer to the brother uh, who asked about um, how do we deal, you know, like, uh, or the sister who uh, asked about, like, it's tough, you know, like to learn about the others and accept. Um, I think, you know, like also there is a verse in the Quran and there is a, tra you know, translation and explanation. It says, أحسن, push a reply with kindness. So even though the person in front of you might be your enemy, it will bring him to be a friend later on. And this is the meaning of it. I did not say the right word, but this is the meaning of it. And kindness, you know, like uh, treat with kindness, this is what I believe on. And thank you. Thank you so much. Can you tell everybody your name? <laughs> oh, my name is Nada Al-Zabi, and I'm a principal of Al-Mishkat School at the Sunday School of the Islamic Center of Union County. Uh, my profession is architecture, but uh, <laughs> this is my daily. <laughs> but this is my... Uh, so that's so we have a few minutes for refreshments and uh, in the lobby. Founders Hall. Thank, thank you all for being yes. here today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight.